I, first of all, I want to thank Rick and, and Leslie, uh, Rick for inviting me to this and, and Leslie for helping us out with the audio visual uh, stuff. Uh, first class people to work with. I really appreciate it. And I got to tell you, I'm very humbled to share this program today with two excellent scientists and Kevin King and Deanna Osmond. So I, I, I just very humbled to, to be on the stage with them, so to speak. But I'm going to talk about what we've been finding in, in managing phosphorus on poultry operations. This is going to look at it phosphorus from a little bit different standpoint. We're not going to be looking so much at runoff from fields, but around the poultry operations themselves, the houses where we load and unload uh, and, and the rainfall and runoff that come from, from the roofs. And I'll tell you why we did that in a little bit. But I, I want to point out to my counterpoint, counter our, my co-leader in Discovery Farms, Dr. Andrew Sharpley. Now, Andrew and I, and, and let me just we, we co-lead this program, and it's more than just data collection. We'll talk a little bit about that, too, as we have time. But before I get started, I wanted to give you a little bit about Arkansas and uh, why we've put so much effort into nutrient management. We've had a lot of different drivers. We've had voluntary efforts. Uh, we've had new regulations come in place, and all this has primarily been driven by the judiciary branch, and, and lawsuits. We've had a lawsuit in Uchi Spavanaugh. We've had one in the Illinois River. Uh, this is cities in Oklahoma suing the poultry integrators in Arkansas. And then the state of Oklahoma sued us in the Illinois River. And uh, at one time, the, you know, Kevin talked about between Canada and Ohio, 0.05. Between Arkansas and Oklahoma, Oklahoma set 0 0.37 milligrams per liter the phosphorus standard for the Illinois River that they wanted Arkansas to meet. And so we've had, our growers in this part of the state, Northwest Arkansas, have undergone tremendous change into what they can do and can't do. They're now under regulations. There's still these uh, lawsuits are outstanding. They haven't got a final ruling. And so their lives and, and how they manage and things have changed completely. Um, some of the other things that we did, though, in these watersheds is that we did pass our own legislation in Arkansas. And now you have to, in these nutrient surplus areas of Northwest Arkansas, you now have to apply poultry litter according to a state certified plan written by a state certified planner. And then the nutrients have to be applied by state certified application. And so we've done all the training on that. How well, and, and, and we've written, we've helped train plan writers to write plans. And I think we've written over 3,000 plans now uh, in, that, in that area. Northwest Arkansas at one time was the highest density of, of uh, uh, poultry operations in the country. Uh, and it's also a very fast growing part of the country from an, from an urban standpoint. And so we've had that classic uh, uh, struggle between urban and rural areas, and especially over the poultry issue. Well, another program that we, we decided to launch, uh, we modeled this after the Arkansas, I mean, after the Wisconsin Discovery Farm, but we wanted a way to get farmers more involved. Uh, we felt like we were just talking to farmers, but we weren't really assisting them or having them involved in these issues. And so we started the Arkansas Discovery Farm Program. It's an on-farm research and demonstration program. We address these local issues like phosphorus and the inter interstate issues. Uh, we try to base this on sound science, being unbiased. Uh, we're stakeholder led. Uh, and we want to empower farmers to be a part of the solution. And we promote conservation. And we evaluate uh, practice effectiveness. And so you can see some of our sponsors. These are just a few um, that we have. Um, we couldn't do it without our partners and without our sponsors. There's no, da no doubt about that. We collect an awful lot of data. Here's where all of our discovery farms are. And if you look in the northwest corner of Arkansas, we're going to focus today on the Marley poultry farm and then the Moore farm, which is poultry and beef. Both are po poultry and beef. But we're doing some things a little bit different on each of those farms. And again, Andrew, Andrew leads our effort on the farms up in this area. And then I lead our effort on the farms and uh, down in this area. So a lot of this data has, the, the collection has been supervised by Andrew. Uh, this is Jeff Marley standing at his pond that was actually created 
to build pads to put his poultry houses. He has 10 poultry houses. Uh, he's got about 2,000 acres of pastures and woodland. Uh, he has 300 head of beef and he grows about 230,000 broilers per grow out. And he has about five flocks per year. Uh, at this time that we went to talk to Jeff about doing monitoring on his farm, we don't go out and say, hey, we need to do this or that, or you need to do this or that. We get them involved in what they're concerned about and what they think the issues are. And for Jeff, he had been to a meeting earlier in, the, in this particular year with EPA. The state of Oklahoma had asked EPA to come over and, and evaluate our poultry operations in Arkansas to see if they, if they should be under the CAFO or the Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation um, guidelines. Uh, in fact, the EPA ruled that they didn't need to be, that, they, that our state program for dry manure management was sufficient. But in that, when they first came over and started inspecting those farms, uh, we had point source inspectors now trying to look and identify non-point sources, but they still gravitated to those things that in their mind might be a point source. And two things they saw were accumulation of dust from these big ventilation fans, and were there nutrients in that dust that were washing away? Was there dust accumulating on the surfaces or the roofs of these long houses? Uh, and then was there a spillage of litter during clean out? And so Jeff really wanted us to evaluate the runoff from around poultry houses and to look and see if we couldn't use a grass waterway and the pond that he already had there as a sink for phosphorus. And so this is an over aerial photograph. Here's the pond that was dug out to build these bases for these houses, the foundation for these houses. And here's where we put the flume. And we also, when we get a chance, if it over, ponds overflows on the other end, we'll take samples. It doesn't happen very often. And then flume two and three. Uh, but let me show you how this, this is runoff flow from, from the highway up here, which is kind of an artificial boundary for the watershed, uh, but there's no culverts. So water flows this way in between these houses and we capture it here at Flume 2. Then we let it go through and this is our grass waterway. We rented this pasture from Jeff. He no longer grazes it. He doesn't fertilize it. We just simply use it as a, a filter strip now. And then we capture water at Flume 3 by this intermittent stream down here. Uh, that flows down here and then turns back this way and flows into the West Fork of the White River, which is a major, major tributary to Beaver Lake, which supplies drinking water to about 500,000 people. And by the way, Jeff is on the board, the Beaver Lake Water District board, our farmer is. So that's how that was set up. And let's just look at the, so you have this drainage area and it flows in and then it flows through this, this uh, filter strip. You can see here's what our configuration very similar to what Kevin, maybe his looked like uh, as far as equipment housing and that sort of thing. Um, but we have these wing walls and then we have a berm here that directs the flow through this H flume. It's released, it moves this way down to flume three. And uh, so that's, that's our setup. Now, what did we find? Well, if you look at the monitoring that we've been doing since 2013 to 2000. 18, if you look at this in pounds per acre per year, uh, this is the percent reduction in these different uh, things. So this is the, uh, the percent reduction, if you look at it. This, is, this would be the, uh, the pounds per acre per year. So you can see we, we lose from flume two, we, we have about five pounds per acre per year of phosphorus running from off around those houses. Uh, when we go through flume three, that's been decreased by about 25%. Same for total P, uh, same for the nitrate. Well, nitrate is much higher. We, of course, we, we realize we have more natural pathways for nitrogen loss than we do for phosphorus loss in terms of, uh, uh, of transformation and that sort of thing. Uh, but same, we get much higher removal of nitrogen than we do from phosphorus. Now we've got about 30% reduction in flow, but one thing we're not showing on this graph, this is averaged over five years. 2016 was a very wet year. And in fact, what we saw was not removal of phosphorus by the system, but it gave back. The filter strip actually gave back phosphorus 
And so we had a net increase in phosphorus loss, uh, which showed us that sometimes you can get weather patterns that overwhelm our conservation practices. We may think that they're going to work all the time. Uh, and so it, it lends to the science of the idea that we've got to monitor these conservation practice effectiveness over a, a pretty long time to, to look at the different weather and the climate. And Kevin talked about how climate has an effect on things. We did have one year that, that didn't remove but gave back. And, and so they're not, they're not always, climate can change how a conservation practice uh, like this functions. In the pond, you can see the runoff comes from these fields, down these houses, and then off the roof of these two and a half houses. And we come to this flume, and then we have the pond that we take measurements in. Uh, again, that's what it looks like. The wing walls and the berms directing the water through there. We just decided to house our equipment up above the flume. Uh, but that's kind of what it looked like. And so this is what we got over the, over the time period from 2013 to 2018. Now this is in concentration because we didn't always know the volume of that pond. But if you look at dissolved P, we cut that almost in half. Uh, total P, uh, quite a bit of reduction, total nitrate uh, in <clears throat> total N. So we know this pond's acting as a sink, but as with any uh, static water body like that, we don't know how long it will act as a sink, but right now it is acting as a sink for both phosphorus uh, and nitrogen. But you can see the reductions that we get once it gets into the pond in terms of concentration. This is the Moore farm, and uh, when we talked to him, he said, look, I've, I've got the same concerns Jeff Marley has, but he said, I want to kind of look at this low impact development techniques that they're using in building uh, uh, subdivisions and, and urban stormwater management. And so he really wanted to look at some, some ways. And these are all the older houses that he had. But when he added the new houses, he wanted to look at some features, uh, stormwater management type features. He wanted to put in a retention basin, found out he, he, he just really did not have the finances to do that at a time and so but we looked at some other things and if you look very closely here you'll see concrete pads so when he constructed this house he put the concrete pads in if you look over here you can see where gravel used to be but you can see where poultry litter has been spilled over the years uh, during clean out of those houses and so he had about 200 acres of corn and wheat back over in this area and he has about 200,000 poultry broilers per flock with about five flocks a year. Here's a big berm that they put in to, to, for us to, to make sure we could isolate the flow from over here, these houses and these houses. Um, so the flow, there's some that comes down here. We compared that to what was coming off his row crop area. Uh, but then we had these two flumes here that captured the runoff from a, right around this area and then right around this area of the houses. Uh, that's what the houses look like that do not have, those are the older houses. These are the newer, newer houses. The feedback we got from the farmer, they love this. So much easier to, to clean up the litter after you've uh, spilled it or clean out. It's just so much better. They, they like it a lot better, even though it is more expensive. Uh, then here's where we had the old houses, new houses. Here's the drain for the old house side drain. We got two ISCO samplers in here uh, because we're monitoring two different things right at the same location. And this is what we found in 2015. Uh, we really reduced the dissolved phosphorus loss from around the new houses. Uh, about the same on total P and on total N we did have some reduction. In 2018, uh, some of the same. We had dissolved P looked very similar. Uh, but the total P was, uh, we removed a lot more with the new houses and those concrete pads. And then we saw a bigger difference in the total nitrogen also. Um, but this is what it looked like. We did increase flow uh, with the new houses. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, the decrease in nutrients, they weren't the same. They weren't the same every year, but they did show a decrease every year in nutrients. Uh, for dissolved P, total P, total N, but flow, we did increase the flow by putting down the impervious 
uh, surface. So there's always trade-offs with these uh, uh, conservation practices and these new ideas sometimes. Uh, just to give you an idea of all of our data, we looked in pounds per acre per year, percent applied. This is corn grown down in southeastern Arkansas, strictly row crops, cotton, uh, pasture. You can see the pasture land in Elkins is a little bit lower than what we're seeing coming off and uh, on loads from uh, uh, row crop fields in eastern Arkansas, uh, where we get a lot more runoff, a lot more precipitation too. And then this is soybean and Atkins. Uh, and again, phosphorus is kind of that same trend. Uh, when we look in pastures, it's a little bit lower in terms of the uh, loading than what we're seeing from row crop farms. Uh, you know, conservation practices can decrease for nutrient runoff. We had two very large storm events in 2016 uh, that it decreased, it just overwhelmed the system. And then the annual variability, we see that in the effectiveness. Uh, one thing we're seeing is that some people had come down and modeled uh, some different things and looking at runoff and, and what we're seeing is what we're measuring at edge of field sites is much lower, order of magnitude lower than what we're seeing that these models are producing. So somewhere there's a disconnect that we've got to work on uh, with the modelers. Uh, some of the challenges is that uh, we have done a hog farm study, uh, very contentious, very controversial. We did the same type of things we did on discovery farms. It was not a discovery farm. Uh, but we have a very liberal Freedom of Information Act uh, rule in Arkansas, and we had to give our raw data as soon as we collected it to other groups. And all different type of groups were making all their type of in interpretations, and so we felt like uh, our data had been hijacked, and uh, that's, that's going to be a concern on this type of data. Uh, opportunities. We really think that the Discovery Farms is allowing our farmers to be a part of the solution process, which is uh, uh, very good because they know their capabilities, they know their land, and they come up with some very creative solutions that maybe we haven't thought about because they're out there working in it every single day. Uh, the stakeholder networks it, it, it really helped us get the word out, get outreach. Uh, we've been working with them through extension. You know, when we, this data that we collect, our, some of our farmers are wanting more data. Uh, it's not enough. Uh, and it's the first time some of them have seen this type of data. Water is the big integrator. Uh, and it gives them an idea of how well they're performing. And they've never been given this data, though. Uh, so we're facilitating farmers to be proactive on the issues. We're, divide, we're involving them in the solution process. I've spent my career in extension, but I can tell you, Farmers will listen to other farmers long before they will anybody else. And our discovery farmers have become some of our best spokesmen for some of these practices and that sort of thing. But the policy makers have really, we just get requests all the time from senators and congressmen, uh, uh, federal government employees wanting to come out to these farms and see what's going on. And it's really even helped us with the non-farm sector that they hear about all this agriculture, but they're not quite sure what's going on. They get a better idea and feel for it when they come out on these tours. Uh, with that, uh, I, I appreciate it again. It's, it's been a pleasure. I'm so thankful you invited me. And uh, you, you, I'm sandwiched around two very good uh, uh, scientists. This is our U.S. Senator from Arkansas, John Bozeman, that called us out of the blue and said, I want to come to a discovery farm. I've heard about them. And so we went to the Johnny Mouse discovery farm uh, where we have four fields that we're monitoring and so you know we never anticipated that type of thing but it's empowered our farmers that's for sure if you want more information we're on facebook we're on twitter we're on instagram i'm not on instagram but our program is and then uh, you can always go to our website here with that i'll turn it back over to deanna osmond